mode. Good afternoon to all my friends in the central time zone. This is Bill Brayton, ATRA Senior Research Technician, and today's lunchtime webinar is the LCT 1000-2000 updates. We've got a tremendous amount of information to cover, so uh, let's take care of some business first, and then we'll get right after it. Today's presentation sponsored by SEAL Aftermarket Products, your source for engineered solutions. And next up, we have a video. Aftermarket Products, engineers and manufacturers, Toledo Transkit, the most trusted and complete kits in the industry for 25 years. Toledo Transkit gives you more critical components, more OE components, like premium seals and gaskets, more design enhancements, patented components, and all the little extras you won't find elsewhere. At Seal Aftermarket Products, we don't just make kits, we make kits better. Toledo Transkit is the number one choice of installers because of all the intensive research and development that goes into each component in every kit. Like re-engineered valve body gaskets, preventing EPC damage by eliminating the shredding you get from original equipment. Plus, all of the extra essentials that are included, like spring and screen filters that should be changed at overhaul. Toledo Transkit even includes loose valve body gaskets that fit all 19 bonded separator plates. When servicing Honda and Acura transmissions, shaft nuts are quite often damaged during removal. Toledo Transkit provides all the main shaft, secondary shaft, and counter shaft nuts, so you don't have to try to reuse the originals or pay extra for them at the dealer. Honda Acura kits also include valve body screen filters, pressure tap washers, and other important components like bolt locks, roll pins, and pistons. What you get is a complete kit with great fit and no wasted time or worry about ordering extra parts. If you want the best sealing transmission kit in the industry, ask for Toledo Transkit by name. Okay. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send an email to webinars at atra.com. And if you have any questions during the webinar, this is a, a, a really information-packed uh, webinar. So if you have any questions about what we're talking about at any time, feel free to hit the uh, questions tab and type your questions in there, and uh, we'll get your questions answered uh, straight away. Also, uh, there have been some changes uh, as recently as five minutes ago uh, to this webinar. If you want to take a picture, you, there's a camera icon up in the upper right. Just give that a double click and that'll shoot a picture of the screen and you'll save that as a JPEG to your desktop. Uh, yeah, we'll get to those changes here shortly. Uh, Here's the rest of the year schedule. Make a copy of this, show it to your uh, guys, and uh, they can all hang out and have lunch and uh, get some education going on there. Next up, uh, May 30th, I'll be doing the 6R80 diagnostics and then the uh, 761 960 AB60 internal webinar in June. And then I believe I'm going to close out the year for my stint on June 27th, but I think the 845 internal may end up being a uh, two or three part series because I want to, we want to keep these to 40 minutes or so to uh, not take up your whole lunch hour. So it gives you time to chill, but uh, <clears throat> yeah. So anyways, that's uh, the upcoming uh, show series. So uh Let's uh, keep moving on here. Save the date. Of course, we have our Powertrain Expo on October 19th through the 22nd. Uh, improve, uh, uh, bigger tech, bigger show, 
bigger fun in Paris, Las Vegas. So uh, do make a point to uh, make plans to attend. And we look, I look forward to seeing some of you every year uh, there in Vegas because I don't travel as much as I used to. So it's uh, good to see uh, my friends from the Central Time Zone there. Okay, so we're going to go over changes uh, that the LCT 1000's gone through over the years, and then look at the latest updates and uh, some of the solenoid changes and the uh, principles of operation as well. So to introduce the uh, Allison, it started in 2000, the Gen 1 from 2000 to 2005 were five speeds. The biggest, the biggest issue they had at that time was the noisy pumps, especially on gas vehicles, not so much on the diesels because of the noise factor with the diesel engine, but on the gas vehicles, it ran much quieter. Uh, the largest customer complaint was the pump line, which was actually normal for that situation. It was just the strain that the pump was under. So in 2004, they added the G-solenoid to lower line pressure uh, and park in neutral uh, to reduce the pump line because it was working on full line pressure. Uh, so they just knocked it down. And that was a, a good fix for that. Now, 06 to 09 Gen 2, uh, the Allison became a six-speed. Uh, in 06, the uh, trim solenoids were changed to pressure control solenoids. They still did the same thing. They just, uh, it, we're going to be seeing all this here in just a second. Uh, they changed the, in, and they also went to an internal mode switch. And 20 and 10 later, Gen 3 Allison's is still a six speed, but the G solenoid was eliminated and it was now a main modulating solenoid to control line pressure. And it, it's just like every other uh, GM transmission. It was a line pressure control solenoid now. And, and along with just those minor changes, the, the internal changes, which we'll see at the tail end here, were huge. And uh, some of these components can be interchanged as complete assemblies, while other components can't be interchanged at all. Speed sensors. Obviously, we have three. The uh, on the output speed sensor on the four-wheel drive was located on the transfer case. Uh, they were two-wire pulse generators. They have a shielded ground to protect it from EMI interference. The uh, depending on the RPM, 150 milli millivolts to 15 volts. And one one comment I have about the numbers there. If you have a, a speed sensor code, and this is kind of across the board with speed sensor codes, and you see that you're not getting a signal from your on your scan tool, well, the first thing you're going to want to do is go down to the sensor itself and check to see if the sensor is outputting voltage. And 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 quite frankly, I don't really concern myself with the numbers when we're diagnosing things. We just want to make sure that that signal exists, whether it's a 150 millivolts or 200 millivolts. I, I, I want to see that there's a number there, because if there's a number there, there should be a number on our scan tool. And if there's a number at the side of the transmission, we know that the speed sensor is speed sensing, and it's not getting to the computer. So that's just a, a diagnostic tip for you there. Uh, engine speed sensors. This was a problem we saw where we were getting a, uh, a torque converter surge without setting codes. And it was because of the dimples getting banged up on the shell of the converter. It's only 33 thousandths or so uh, clearance. So it would see that disruption in the signal and that would cause the signal to vary, causing the torque converter to surge. And it, yet it wasn't enough for it to, to uh, uh, set a code, but it was also something that you may need to watch on your oscilloscope uh, and not, it wouldn't be necessarily caught on the scan tool. And then, of course, you know, the sensor was eliminated in 07. So here's a, a, a valve body tip. 
uh, if we're working on Dodge products, this is, and, and we're identifying the solenoids, but it's also an assembly tip for Dodge products. The trim A and trim B solenoids from the Allison will swap directly over in place of the uh, Dodge linear type solenoids because uh, Dodge, you can buy solenoids from the Dodge dealer for 3500 bucks. They just comes with a free valve body. So those Allisons will interchange and they're only 120 bucks. So that's a good way to save your shop some, some dough right there. Uh, okay, and here's the underside showing the shift solenoid C on the earlier valve bodies. And then in 2004, we got the G solenoid with its own body. And this was to reduce the line pressure. We're going to be seeing how it does that here shortly. The separator plate changes from 01 and 03 to 04 to 05. Remember, these, these plates cannot be interchanged. Here we go from 2006 to 2009, uh, where we changed from trim solenoids to pressure control solenoid A and B. The shift solenoids are still, at this point, C, D, and E. And uh, we have the uh, TCC PWM, of course. But now we've got a pipe added for the G solenoid from 04 to 09. And you guys know how I love my hydraulics. I couldn't uh, I couldn't let a, a, a webinar go by without some hydraulics here to show you exactly how the G solenoid works. Over here on the upper right hand corner we have the main main modulator or the G the G solenoid. If they call it the mod main solenoid in this picture, but it works over here on our left where this arrow's at. So that when we come to a stop. We're at a low load situation and in neutral and park, these two work together to knock down pressure because you can see that it over here on the left when the modulator, the, the G solenoid is working, it works to push this, out, push this valve down, which opens it up to exhaust pressure here. So that does two things. That lowers line pressure and increases increases cooler flow. So that is that knocks down its noise. That that's to knock down the pump pressure on the pump to uh, to quiet it down. And that's how it works hydraulically. And this is a modulating solenoid. This is not an on-off solenoid. And it, it had the ability to be a uh, modulating solenoid until they went to 06 where they turned it into a full modulating solenoid. Okay, so here's our main valve body from 2000 and 2009, although along 06 there were some changes. Okay, so, so these are the valves and spring measurements as we took them. Yours may vary, so if they're slightly off, that's okay. You can see over on the left, we have two accumulators, one each for the trim solenoids or the uh, pressure control solenoids, as they're called later on. And the shift valve body uh, from 2000 to 2009. And there's a uh, a couple of areas here that we want to pay close attention to because we would get if this solenoid feed filter, if it's clogged up, will cause a no movement condition without setting any codes. 
and also the printer switch may read shift inhibited. So it's very, very critical to remove and clean or replace that solenoid feed filter to ensure that those problems don't occur. And also, this, this E-shift valve is very finicky. We seem to get a lot of com codes here at the tech line relating to this shift valve. Because at this E valve, e, this E shift valve stick, what you'll get is a solenoid, an E solenoid performance code. Because the solenoid is commanded to turn on, and the valve does not respond because it's sticking, and it doesn't see a change in the E pressure switch in the pressure switch manifold, which we're going to be seeing here very shortly, and then it causes a solenoid performance code. Now, that doesn't mean we change the solenoid because that's typically what guys are going to do. Well, if the solenoid's not working right, then we need to change that and then they're surprised that the E solenoid performance code comes back because it's really not related to the solenoid at all. It's related to this number three shift valve E stuck. It's sticking in its bore, and it's not doing what the what it's being commanded to do by the solenoid, and the computer picks that up via the pressure switch. So, so just be aware of that. That's you know, and and I've always said every valve out of every bore, the life you save may be your own. Those valves should drop in onto their bores. The the anodizing should be nice and smooth and not worn off in any any places. And uh, so they should just drop in on their bore, and you won't have that problem. Okay, uh, some solenoid command confusion. We've got some calls here on the tech line where, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, tech may be looking at some aftermarket information that's not correct, and they got worried about it and they maybe had some problems, and they... Uh, didn't have the right information. Well, this is uh, up to 04, mid 04, and then 04 and later. Uh, the proper, the proper uh, shift solenoid C operating state. So uh, this is the definitive piece of information here. Anything that is different from that, uh, do not use. Okay, that's just a heads up on that shift solenoid logic right there. Okay, here we've got the 2010. Now, here's where things just are going to blow up. Okay, with the 2010 to 2013, they made so many changes and so many changes. Okay, and let's just start here where the G solenoid was eliminated and the main modulating solenoid was added. And so now it's just a, a regular line pressure control solenoid that just called the main modulating. But also notice that the A, the, the C, F, and E solenoids got different names. The C, D, and E, there we go, got now their shift solenoids 1, 2, and 3 along with the pressure control solenoids. And now it's a, yeah, instead of a pressure control F, it's a TCC pressure control solenoid, which it's always been, but uh, they finally decided to call it by what it does. Also very important is the retainer bracket, because if you don't have that retainer bracket on correctly, you're going to have some assembly issues. That's a good picture to see right here. The... Here's our pressure switch manifold. Now, <clears throat> this works different from the other pressure control pressure switch manifolds that, like for example, on a 4L60E, where the pressure switch tells that tells the computer where the manual valve is at, the position of the manual valve. On the Allison we see that it's got an E, a C, a D, and also a reverse pressure switch, but the important ones are the C, the E, and D. 
that tells the computer the status of the shift valves. I was talking about the valve not moving. Well, this is where this is where we can we've got the pressure switch. The computer commands the E solenoid to change state. And as it does that, it looks to the E E pressure switch and expects to see a change there. See, that's where the performance codes come up. That's how it tells whether the valve has moved or not is where the pressure switch where the pressure switch is is not seeing that valve moving. So a stuck valve can cause that solenoid performance code. It commanded it to happen, and it didn't happen. A pressure switch, a faulty pressure switch, not reading correctly, can cause that solenoid code as well. My point here is, is don't, don't throw a solenoid at solenoid performance codes on an Allison. You have to do a little more work than just that. Okay. Um, uh, another diagnostic tip, if you think you have a pressure switch that's not functioning, you can go to the plug-in, you see on the upper right where we've got A, B, C, D, and E, and F. You can go to the male plug-in in the harness, and if you have this plug-in and the scan tool and yourself on the same place, you take that male plug and use a jumper wire and ground A, B, and C with the key on, engine off, and as you ground that and ground that and unground it at the C, at A, B, and C terminals, you should see the C, D, and E signals change as you ground it and unground it from open to close, low to high, off to on, whatever the scan tool says. Yes, no. As long as you get a state change when you're grounding and ungrounding those A, B, and C wires, and that works correctly on your scan tool, you know now that from where you're grounding it all the way up to the TCM or PCM, that the wiring is good and the chances are you have a switch problem or maybe a stuck valve problem, but it's not a wiring issue. That's just a, that, that's not in the text. That's just uh, one of my diagnostic tips that you can use. I talk to people all day on the, the tech line here, and that's one of the exercises I give to them if they're having pressure switch codes or even uh, 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 solenoid performance codes related to pressure switches not working correctly. So that's just one way to uh, handle the, uh, the pressure switches. Okay, so now moving on to the neutral start backup switch. Here we've got a, an updated switch. They were having weather concerns with the early black dual connector. So they updated it with uh, a little more of a rugged uh, weather, weather uh, tolerant pre uh, backup light switch, neutral start switch. With they also there's also uh, repair pigtails because these connectors get broken and and uh, they're difficult to deal with at times. Well, the thing you have to worry about with your electrical guy or your R and R guy is whoever's changing out the pigtails, they've got to have the pigtail there before they cut it off. Uh, we get a lot of times where the guys are changing these without having the connector right there and decided to cut the four pin wire or the seven pin wire pigtail off before they got the connector there and didn't have a wiring diagram and found that when they got the uh, harnesses, all the wires were white. So we were getting guys that were hooking those up incorrectly. So the point is, have the new replacement connector there and replace those one wire, wire for wire at a time to prevent any kind of delay in the job because that's what happens is you end up 
uh, going to your Mitchell or All Data or uh, or calling us here at ATRA at the IBO and hey, send us a wiring diagram, and that holds up the whole issue. So uh, and that's not fun for anybody. So uh, make sure you get that uh, handled that way. And then in two four two thousand four, the PNBU went to a single black connector, went to a black switch single connector. And then in 2006, they decided to take that switch out of the elements and put it inside the transmission to become an internal mode switch in 06 and on. Some other changes that were made in 06 and 07 models included the T5 bearing, improved durability, uh, and the P2 carrier and sun gear uh, were changed uh, dimensionally to handle that bearing. That went into production September 2006. Also, there was uh, input shaft ceiling rings for improved durability. Those are interchangeable, and you'll see on the right here whether they're interchangeable or not. And they really, the only way they're in, in uh, interchangeable as a, is a set. And in the, a, the upcoming slides, you're going to see um, charts like this and the interchangeability is to the far right because we always want to know you know, we're mechanics. We always want to know what we can mix and match and, and move around. Well, this these charts make it really clear as to what was changed and what the interchangeability is. So here's the uh, P2 sun gear dimension differences. Uh, and the carrier shaft was increased in size. All this for durability. And the, the, uh, here's the T5 bearing. Now, now this is what I want you guys, I want you folks to key, on, key in on right here, is on your handout, this literally, this literally, these numbers were changed like five minutes before I, I looked at it. Because as you'll see right here, these numbers on your paper are incorrect. Your paper says, and I was reading this in the last one, it says on the left it says 40 millimeters and on the right it says 52 millimeters. Well that's not right and and that is a direct typo from the factory manual. We, uh, I was looking at that during the last show and I says, well, wait a second, that can't be right. So that's where your information is going to differ. So, okay, those are the differences, 06, 07, the T5. Now we're going to some pump stuff. We're going to get back to even more changes here in just a second. Uh, the pump converter, the pump bushing was updated. Now it's that... It's that uh, burnt orange Teflon coating. If you see any bushing material, if you see any bushing material missing and the bronze showing through, of course the, the, that pump bushing should be replaced, but also uh, you want to maybe take a look at why it's worn like that. Maybe we've got a bent flywheel or uh, something wrong with the converter. So you really, that's very, very critical. Uh, Let's see, also we have some spring changes that were made uh, for the converter relief and the lube regulator springs. The converter spring can be changed separately. And, and this, this chart on the left is just a spec chart for when you're going through and checking out the measurements of the pump as part of your rebuild. And early on, they, 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 this pump has been a, a moving target since this unit came out. Because of the wine, they wanted to redesign the gears to quiet them down. Uh, 
And then finally the latest iteration with the third design where we've got 22 inner and 26 outer. Uh, these pumps will service all the way across the board. Two thousand and eight saw us get a uh, bearing Torrington bearing update with some hardened races uh, for the rest of the unit. They're identified by the blue stripe on the bearing race, and that uh, that does not come off. So don't worry about the, those being washed off. And here is here is where it blows up you've got so many changes uh, most of them are updated to uh, address the engine torque up from that uh, Duramax diesel engine and also to improve fuel economy because they were achieved, and over here I underlined, achieved the reduced spin losses. The changes were made to achieve reduced spin losses and maintain balanced lube pressure. Because when you, when you reduce spin losses, you reduce load on the engine, and therefore you increase uh, fuel mileage. And just to highlight a few of them, the converter was increased. Uh, we added a roller clutch inside the converter, the shafts, the front support were all changed, the wave frictions in the C3, C4 for reduced friction loss, and we've had C4. So you've got so many changes here that you need to be aware of when you're working on these units, and especially when you think you want to interchange port, interchange parts. Now here, these next few pages are the charts that talk about the description of the change. There's so many of them, we, we don't have enough time to go through all of them. But uh, for example, you know, uh, we just want to note the asterisks here. Uh, you can see that you need to check your Allison distributor before ordering to make sure that they have that stuff in stock before you start making the changes here. Okay, and this tells you what changes you can. All right, and we're going to be seeing some of those changes here in just a second. Mm. Here's another chart that you can interchange. Allison doesn't recommend it, but if you're going to change parts, you need to change them as, a, as a, an assembly, especially referring to... Uh, the uh, input shafts and, and the center shafts as well, which we'll see here in a minute. And then lastly, we have some valve body changes that they made. And as you can see on the right hand, once that 2010 change came about, none of it, none of it will back service to any of the earlier models. So there's a ton of changes. That's three pages of changes that they made from 2010 to 2011. <clears throat> ah, four pages make that. And so your interchangeability, like I said, and the description of the change is right there. And, uh, and why it was done. And, of course, there's very little on this page. Maybe a clip and a valve stop. Is the only thing that's going to interchange here. <clears throat> okay, uh, there was a change uh, again today earlier. Uh, these pictures were transposed from this slide to the next slide. Uh, you can click on the uh, the PDF tab on your screen to get the latest and greatest uh, PDF and it'll show these pictures in their correct order that was just something I noticed earlier today and that has to do with the lube orifices reduced on the turbine shaft assembly and you can retrofit it back but you also have to use the main shaft 
because they, those two work in concert. So you can do that as well. So, and, and there again, all this stuff, the shafts, the pump, the valve, valve updates, the reduced lube orifice size, uh, the design changes were all made to improve uh, fuel economy because getting fuel economy out of these big trucks was quite a chore. So that's the main reason for these changes. I know it sounds a little redundant, but uh, yeah, everything's about fuel mileage these days. So in here, there again, we've got the C1, C2 clutch housing that along with the other lube orifices, you can see the changes here uh, from the former to the current and the reduced, reduced size. Okay, updated shaft parts. So this is uh, for the, uh, the ground, what they call the ground sleeve or the stator support. And uh, you have to use the parts with the updated shaft, uh, with the turbine shaft and the main shaft and the output shaft. That's all a package deal. The converter was updated with a dual friction clutch. Uh, the stator clutch was changed to a, a one-way roller, of course, all for durability. And it can be identified by the swedge marks located between the converter pads, and they will not, they'll not design to back service, okay? They also made software changes for the variable main pressure modulation or the pressure control solenoid. Uh, enhance fast learn for a few examples and also uh, yeah there was some service tool as there was some service tool valve testing is added to the software as well man they were busy on the uh, valve body here I'm not going to go through all of these bullet points here uh, you know we've already talked about the uh, the uh, main, the G solenoid going away. When the G solenoid went away and they put the uh, uh, main modulating there, they got rid of that extra body. It's a new, it's a Bosch variable bleed solenoid. Uh, that's just another name for the main modulating pressure control. And of course, with the solenoid changes, the harness, <clears throat> harness was updated. They added some check balls and uh, check capsules uh, to the ends of the trim circuits, which we'll see here in a second. And they added some uh, uh, retainers for the valves. So let's see if we've got a pill. We have a picture of that coming up in a minute. Let's see. Passages, the main valve body, new passages. Okay, that's we've already talked about that. And the only thing that really remains the same are the SS2 and the SS3 solenoids here. So here's a look at our 2010 updated valve body. Notice over here on the left, it's got three accumulator valves instead of two. Uh, the, the pressure control solenoid slash trim solenoid always had an accumulator valve to take up the solenoid pulses. Well, with the addition of the uh, main modulating solenoid, it got, its own, uh, it got its own accumulator as well. That's why the addition of the third. Of course, you can see the retainers over on the right. And also, we've got a little note up there at the top. Rougher flaring shift if the ceiling if the balls aren't sealing in the capsule. So when we go through this unit, we want to make sure number one they're free of debris and number two that they're seating on their seats properly. Here is the shift valve body for the 2010-2013 with the addition of the main modulating solenoid. I showed you earlier about the Retaining bracket being installed correctly. Uh, also, you can see the retainers for the 
Uh, shift valves are a little bit different. The, the shift valve 3 is still in the same spot. It still deserves lots of TLC because we don't want to have any codes being caused by that sticky valve. So whenever you have that apart and out, be sure to pay close attention there. Now, we do have some part numbers for you. Of course, those are, those are always dynamic, and the measurements that we have here for you are as well. Uh, these are factory numbers, and most of the ones that I measure personally you are not going to hit right at this number, and if they don't hit right at this number, don't worry about it too much. If it's slightly under what it's talking about, it's going to be just fine. Don't have to run out and change them. So, so, so that's my take on the spring diameters. Now, uh, that's it for today's show. Uh, I know I've covered quite a bit of information here in a short amount of time. Uh, but and this is something that you want to print out and keep around you keep around when you're working on these Allisons because there's been so many updates especially on the 2010 2013 because the, you guys are making a there's making crazy amounts of horsepower out there so you want to be sure that you have all the matching parts or things put together correctly so that uh, you won't have any problems because the fewer problems we have the more fun with transmissions we have. So, that being said, I want to thank, are there any questions? Okay, any questions or comments you might have here while I, while I close this thing up, you can type that in. I guess I'd like to uh, thank our sponsor, Seal Aftermarket Products, for sponsoring our webinar today. All the rest of the uh, uh, sponsors over there on the side. And if there are no questions... I would like to thank you for attending, and my name is Bill Brayton. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.